Hey everybody, we want to thank you for being with us today. We're marching through the book of Matthew, chapter 11. We begin it today. Last week, Jesus told his fellows what to do. Today, he follows up on their work. God is with you wherever you go. He's going to do the work, and he that started the work in you will be faithful to complete it in you. Open up your Bibles, turn to chapter 11 in Matthew, and follow along with us as we walk through the word of Jesus. at us in the face as disciples and said, man, if you love anybody more than you love me, you are not worthy of me. Now that's a time for us to pause and say, all right, Lord, let's let's do a, a, a heart check here. Do I love anything or anybody more than you? He started that whole thing out with, hey, remember, I did not come to send peace on this world. What? Christmas time, peace on earth goodwill toward men. Yeah, that's what he came to sin, but it was rejected. So when the Jews rejected it, he wants us to now know because peace has been rejected. And guys, there is peace on earth. It only happens inside the heart of the Christian. Only those who receive Jesus, who receive the Messiah, who receive the Lamb, only those people have peace. But the rest of them, He's, came to send, he's come to send a sword. And there's going to be a division taking place in homes. He says, I'm come to set at variance mothers against daughters, fathers against sons, uncles against nephews, family members against family members. And what does that mean? When a person in the family receives Jesus, there's going to be a severing between me and the rest of them. They're going to use the sword to cut me off. People hate Christians. People will be your buddy, be your buddy, be your buddy, be your buddy till you become a Christian that loves them, a Christian that prays for them, a Christian that wants the best for them, a Christian that wants to see them in heaven. When that happens, you're not my friend. I'd rather hang out with people who are two faces, who talk bad about me, who stand against me, who, who eh, you can't trust. That's who people want as friends. That's who people want as family. We also look, Jesus says, hey, if you love anybody on this family more than me, you're not worthy of me. And we also talk the importance of raising children, raising grandchildren. We don't raise people, our children, to depend on us. We raise them to depend on the Lord. Because the Bible clearly speaks about leaving and cleaving. When a child is of age, they leave home, they leave under. If you don't pay taxes for them no more, they're on their own in the eyes of God, I believe, too. If they're not your dependent... They've become God's dependent. And they need to be trained early that one day I will no longer be your dependent. Now, that doesn't mean mom and dad quit being mom and dad and mom and dad quit helping. We're saying mom and dad quit being the source of dependence for these kids. God has got to become the source of dependence for all of us. And every human being that lives needs to learn to depend on the Lord and Him alone. So when they step outside of mom and daddy's dominion and protection and their insurance, and everything else about them, they need to be able to stand with the Lord. And what we talked last week too, parents, is you got to understand when you love God more than you love anybody else, you got to understand that your kids are not your kids. They are God's kids. And He has trusted you and given you the responsibility to raise His kids. Now that's a privilege. If we would look at it in the eyes of Scripture, my kids are not my kids. We don't have anything. Anything that we have, the Bible says every good gift. Are your children a gift from heaven? The Bible says every good gift, perfect gift, comes from God above. Every gift. And so your children are a gift from Him. They are His kids. He's loaned to you because He entrusted you with His precious ones. And now you have the privilege to raise them in Scripture, in the light of the Lord, in the Word of God. You have that responsibility and to get them out from underneath your dependence. Because you're God's kid, I want you depending on Him. 
Get in the Word, children. Know the Word. Know the Holy Spirit as He speaks to you. Obey Him now when you're young. The Bible says, train a child up in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from the ways he was trained up. It's important you train your kids when they're little the things of God to make them dependent on Him while they're young. Understanding they are His kids, not necessarily yours. Why? Because in most cases, the parents die first. And now what's the kid going to do? He's going to trust the Lord. He's going to keep on trusting the Lord like he did while Mama's was still here. And that's what God said. We don't need to love anything more than God, so we stop and we pause and we say, Lord, if that's not true in my life, will you please make it true? He answers prayer. He answers prayer according to His will, which is according to his character, according to his word. His word says it so. And say, Lord, my heart really ain't where it needs to be. There's things and people that I love more than you. But I really want the inverse to be true. I want to love you more than anything, and I want you to know it. I want people around me to know it. Will you please activate that truth in my heart and in my life? And he will. He'll make it become a reality in your heart. And you'll understand and start seeing that God is number one in your life because he answers prayer. Aren't you thankful God answers prayer? And he wants us to pray according to his word, according to his will, according to his name, according to his character. And when I read the Bible, and that's why we encourage you to read the Bible, you find something, you go, oh, that doesn't match, I don't match up with that. Lord, will you help me match up with that? And he answers that prayer, and he does that for you. Isn't that great? And he grows you, and he carves off all the old junk that doesn't need to be there, and he turns you into a new creation. Right after that, remember, Jesus sent his six teams... 12 fellows, two by two, into the towns of Israel and said, go preach, go heal, go raise the sick and, and the dead, and go cleanse the leper, and go cast out devils. Just go and tell them I'm coming. So that's what happened. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard, this is John the Baptist, when he had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or are we looking for somebody else? Jesus answered and said unto them, Hey, you go and show John again those things which you have heard today and what you have seen. The blind have received their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And we're going to go start immediately there with verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve to go out, that they departed, and then he followed behind them, and began to teach and to preach in their cities. He followed behind them. They did their job. They obeyed. They went with power, endued from on high. They had the power to do the same things you and I have the power to do. That's why Erica raised her hand and said, I need you to pray for my aunt. Because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that all of us bind together. We believe that God is a great healer. That God wants to get people's spirits right, their hearts right, and their bodies right. We all believe he's capable of doing all those holy, right? To completeness, to perfection, right? That's why we bound our hearts together going to this one we trust in and say, Lord, you do this, please. We ask you, we beg you, we pray according to your character, according to your scripture, according to your word. You told us to do these things. We're doing it in obedience. And the only reason we're doing this is because we know you can do it. And we're trusting that you will do it. And that's why we do that. We follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. And we go and do what he says. And he's there for follow-up. Aren't you thankful that in your life, Jesus is there for follow-up? Like, for instance, I go, I'm out on the street, I'm downtown, I'm down at the brick house, people are coming out and stuff, we're talking with people or whatever, and, I'm, and we bring up a conversation, hey, 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 uh, don't want to hold you up tonight, I see you're smoking a cigarette, we got at least seven minutes, is it, is it cool if I talk to you, ask you a question or two? Well, yeah. Okay, this is coming from a churchy stance. Um, if you died right now, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? I don't know. I grew up in church, but I just and they come back with their rhetoric and they come back with what they're saying and you ask your question, da 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 da. Oop, gotta go back in, crush the cigarette out, and they walk away. Now I'm like, Lord, will you follow up on that? 
Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that I got there and all I had was the seed and I threw it out, but it didn't get watered? I don't even know what kind of soil it hit. The Bible tells us there's four different kinds of soil of the heart. When the seed of God is thrown, it'll land on one of those four. We'll come across that in the future. But aren't you thankful that it's not all up to you to see that the job's done? We just do our part when we can, where we're at, without stress, without strain, without pressure. The devil will bring that on you. You should have led that guy to the Lord. You should have talked more about Jesus. No, Jesus does the follow-up. He sends me where I go. I go there. I do my job. Jesus said some people ain't going to believe in when they don't. Wipe the dust off your feet and head on into the next town. I'll be there for follow-up. Jesus has got your back. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who changes lives. Jesus is the one who can take a heart that is hardened and bitter and cold and stoic and I'm not going to change. White knuckle, I'm holding on here. Eh, eh, eh. And the Holy Spirit can follow up on that in prayer and melt the hardest of hearts. Soften the hardest of necks. Put some oil in those dudes and make them work. Ah, look. Oh, that neck can turn one way or the other. I don't have to be stiff-necked all the time. Jesus does the follow-up. And when Jesus does the follow-up, he does a great job of it. So where you go, you go just like the disciples were sent. You go where you are to work. Boom. Represent him well, and you got to go do something else. Jesus right there will do the follow-up in dude's heart, in honey's heart. He begins to do a work in their heart. You initiate it as his ambassador, as his representative, and he'll do the follow-up. Trust him to do the follow-up. Who are you praying for today? you got to trust Jesus to do the follow-up. you got to trust Jesus to take care of biz. It's his kingdom. It is his power. It is his changing. Without him, we can do nothing. Trust Jesus in the follow-up. And sometimes he'll send you to follow behind him, to represent again. Something else will come up. You just represent heaven, whatever that means. We don't have to force anything. If the Holy Spirit tells you something, he'll only tell you to do something because that person is ready for it. If he's not telling you to do something, pray. Say, Lord, I need your follow-up on this. And he'll direct your paths. He'll let you know how to witness, how to share, how to cast out devils. Do you guys believe that there's devils that exist on the planet today? Anybody ever witness it yourself? I want to see your hands. Okay, we've got one, we've got two, three, four. The devils exist on the planet. Do you think there are people out there in Jonesboro who have devils working in their homes on them who want to be delivered? Anybody believe that? I like to be a place where they can come find deliverance. We pray about that. Because Jesus sent these disciples out and we are the disciples. Remember, a disciple disciples somebody who disciples somebody who disciples somebody who disciples somebody who came to you. Oh, to disciple somebody, to disciple somebody. That's our calling. That's our game plan. We are called as disciples to disciples. And you are not a disciple unless you're a discipler. And it's a matter of the heart. It's like, Lord, make me a discipler. I, I pray according to your name, according to your will, according to the, in accordance to your word. Make me what you want me to be. And he'll do it. He did it with these guys. When, you, when we looked at the life of Matthew and we looked at these guys, they're a bunch of losers. God loves, his specialty is losers. He loves to take losers and turn them into something different. Make them winners. Aren't you thankful about that? That includes me, y'all. <laughs> Praise God. I didn't have to start out right. He makes you right. And it's a long process. It's until the day you drop or he comes. I'm looking for his rapture. The signs are all lining up. He told us when you see the blood red moons of 1948, he didn't say it like that, but what he said was this. When you see Israel form again, know that there's only one generation left. Generation is 70 to 80 years. We are in that generation. We are at the end of that generation. So there we are. We need to be looking up. Now, Jesus is doing the follow-up. Then all of a sudden, what did John do? John was preaching the truth. John looked right in the face of Herod, the king. He said, you're a snake, brother. You are sinning against the word. The Bible says, do not, do not, do not commit adultery against your brother. Herod had stolen his brother's wife and made her his own. John looked at him in the face and said, that is evil, brother. That's wrong. Herod knew it, man. And Herod the king didn't do anything about it. Why? Because Herod liked John. Herod thought he was right. But the mistress didn't like that. 
mistress got pretty angry about that. And she thought, who is this hairy, leather-wearing, crazy-preaching prophet who dips people out there in the river? Where does he, little old he, come off pointing his finger in my man's face, telling him he is wrong because of the sex he's having with me? And she held this in her heart, held this in her heart, held this in, his, in her heart. So one day Herod had a party. And one day his stepdaughter, his mistress's daughter, came out and did a little timbrel dance. Boy, everybody loved it. Oh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. And so he was all drunk and buzzed up real heavy. And he said, hey, listen, little girl, you are awesome. He says, I want to give you a big present for that great dance. I'll give you up to half this entire kingdom. What is it you want, baby? We'll get it for you. And he's boasting himself on his greatness and what he has available at his fingertips to give people, even little girls who, who do a pretty little dance. She runs back to Mama's chamber and she goes, I just did a great dance and Uncle Herod loved it. Uncle Herod, her daddy's brother, is now her stepdad. And Uncle Herod loved it. Uh, he said he'd give me half the kingdom. What do we want? And she says, you tell him I want John the Baptist's head on a plate. I want his head on a plate. I want him dead for pointing his finger in our faces, accusing us of what the Bible says is sin. We don't like that. So she goes running back and Herod sees her. Hey, little baby girl, like I said, everybody listen up. Listen up. I'm going to give her a gift. What is it you want, baby? I'm going to give you up to half the kingdom. What do you want? She says, I want John the Baptist's char his head on a charger, on a plate. And it struck his heart because he liked John the Baptist. He knew the people liked John the Baptist. He knew what John the Baptist was saying was kind of true. And he didn't want to do it. But because of his big boasting, he had it happen. And he said, get John the Baptist and throw him in jail. So Jesus is out doing his miracles. And the word comes back to John the Baptist while he's in jail. And it says, now when John had heard while he was in the prison the works that Jesus was doing, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Are you him that's supposed to come as the Messiah? Or are we supposed to be looking for someone else? You ever been down? You ever been discouraged? You ever thought, man, you know, I've, I've been in this Christian thing for a long time and all I ever see is that things getting worse. Things hardening against us. Things coming at us and it seems like there's no letting up. It seems like there's no pressure relief. It just seems like it gets worse and worse and worse. Is this thing worth it? John the Baptist, remember John the Baptist? He was the one who was baptizing people, preaching repent. He's the one that pointed in the face of Herod and said, you're wrong. He was the one who was doing the right thing. And it was told him by the Holy Spirit, one of these days you're going to see the Messiah come with your own eyes. And you're going to know. And when you see this, the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, you will know that's who it is. So John's out baptizing folks. He's baptizing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Repent. Turn away from what these snakes on the bank, these Pharisees and Sadducees have been saying. You turn away from what, they're, what they say and you do what the Bible says to do. Obey the Bible. Turn to God. And one day in line was his cousin Jesus. Jesus was his cousin, six months younger than he. And he's 30 years old. He's in line to be... To be baptized. He thought, what? And all of a sudden, he brings him in and he says, dude, I should be baptizing you, not you, me, because he saw something. He saw the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the Holy Spirit had said, whoever you see the Spirit descending on him like a dove, this is the chosen one. And he realized all of a sudden, my cousin is the chosen? My, my cousin Jesus? You know? And then he got to thinking, you know, I've never seen him do wrong. I've never seen him say evil things or join in on bad conversations. I uh, never saw him gossip. You know, this is him. And he believed. And he says, I'm not even worthy to tie your shoes, to, to do your sandal latchets. I'm not even worthy. You should be... Jesus said, come on, dude, just baptize me, will you? <laughs> I said, all right. Because Jesus came to identify himself with us, with humans, with the way we die. God doesn't die. Humans die. But he became a human to die. And it was a picture of his death, his burial, his resurrection, which gives us all life. Even on Christmas, our emphasis needs to be the resurrection, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he said, remember this till I come. We have this season for that reason of his death, burial, and resurrection. John the Baptist baptizes him. He tells everybody, listen, listen, I want you guys to look at this cat. Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
This is him! And he sends him off, and later he continues his preaching, preaching, preaching until Herodias, that was Philip's wife, Herod's new shack, uh, had him thrown in jail. And now he's sitting in jail and he's thinking, this, this don't seem like heaven. This don't seem like victory. This don't seem great and grandeur and the Messiah ruling and the kingship. And he had two of his followers that followed him everywhere he went. He said, I need you guys to go down. I heard what Jesus is doing. Will you go ask him if this is really him or are we looking for somebody else? And that's what it says right here. Verse 4. It says that they, they went ahead and asked Jesus that. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Hey, buddy, you go back and show Cousin John what you have seen here today, what you hear. And when the two guys showed up from prison, John was down. He was dejected. He was hurting. But I wonder also if the disciples weren't down and hurting. You know, they're like, John... You preach repentance. You preach Jesus. We saw you baptize Jesus. Is this really him? Is this really him? I wonder if the emphasis was not that John was depressed and John was down and John was doubting, but maybe his disciples were. And he had heard that Jesus was doing these great miracles and he said, guys, I need you to go follow Jesus. You go see for yourself and ask him yourself. And they went down there and they said, Hey, John sent us here to ask you, are you the Messiah or are we looking for somebody else? And he said, Y'all watch this. And the disciples were out doing their thing and Jesus was doing a wonderful follow-up and people were being healed. Sight was coming back to the blind. Those that were deaf could now hear. And they were seeing this stuff, seeing the sign, seeing everything. And he says, Now I want you to go back to John in the prison where it's dark and dungy and there's sorrow of heart most likely and tears. Go back there and you just tell him what happened? What's that going to leave up to John? Faith. He was sitting in a dungeon. He didn't get to see resurrections. He didn't get to see blind people getting their sight back. He didn't get to observe those that couldn't hear now hearing. He didn't get to see demons cast out. He had to trust in a story. He had to trust in the prophets. He had to trust in the messengers who were eyewitnesses to what Jesus did. And that's why the discipleship in Jerusalem grew so rapidly because there were so many eyewitnesses who saw what Jesus did, who told their friends, who told their friends, who told their friends, who told us. And when you and I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit reveals to us and he gives us a vision to see as Jesus died on the cross. He gives us a vision to see as he ministered to help us to see what we didn't see before. But we hear the Spirit of God speak and he puts his stamp of approval on it and he says, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the one. Don't look for another. He is the one. Remember his miracles. Remember his love. Remember his forgiveness. Remember everything about him and you'll know that he is the chosen one. There's none like him. Follow him. Observe him. And when you're in your dark dungeon, when you're in your dark place and it's hard to believe, you get that Bible out and you believe and you say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me who the right one is. And it always comes back, Jesus. And when you start saying the name of Jesus or Yeshua, salvation, Jesus, God is salvation. You are the chosen one. You are the one. Life comes back into you even if you're sitting in the middle of a cold, dark dungeon. Any of you ever sit in a cold, dark dungeon? It may not be a real place. It might be a spiritual, emotional place. But Jesus will come to you in that dungeon and he'll bring you life. He will bring you liberty. He will bring you hope. He will bring all that to you. Why? Because the name of Jesus does that. Jesus is him. We're not looking for another. And Jesus warned us. He said, Some of them, they're going to come from the desert. They're going to come from the mountains. They're going to come if through your television set saying, I am he. I am the Messiah. Or they'll be even preaching that the Jesus of the Bible is the Messiah. But you don't preach that Jesus is the Messiah of the Bible and throw a conjecture in there. But it's Jesus and Jesus thus Jesus, it is finished. It's not Jesus, but I've got a new revelation. If the revelation is not found in Scripture, don't receive that revelation. Is it He, or do you look for another? If it's He, understand and obey the words of His Scripture, of His Word, the Word of God. The Bible says every word of God is pure. Every word has been given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They are God-breathed. Every word, word by word, line on line, Precept on precept. Do you understand the importance of God's word? Do you understand the importance of why we say read it and know it and hide it? Because someday you're going to be sitting in a cold, dark dungeon somewhere and you're going to need the heat and the light of the gospel coming your way. 
Someday you may not have a Bible at your readiness to be able to read and bring you that warmth. It might need to be hidden in your heart that you will not sin against God. You might need to be able to conjure up a Bible verse of truth out of your heart because you studied it, you memorized it. The Bible says the only time in the King James Version that it uses the word success, it comes when people understand, read, know, share, and memorize the Bible. Joshua 1.8 And then you'll make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Why? I've hidden the Lord's word in my heart. The Spirit of God ignites that word and no matter how cold or dark or miserable the dungeon is, God gives me heat and He gives me light. That's why Paul could sit in a Mamertine prison, man, chained up for doing the right thing and be worshiping God at night at midnight. When the earthquake comes and the walls around you collide and fall and smash and destroy everything, you can still have a song in your heart. Why? Because you have the Word of God hidden in your heart. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Thy word have I hid in my heart that when troubles come, I have a word to share. I can speak to those troubles. I can speak to those devils. I can speak to that sickness because it's only the word of God coming out in faith. That which is not done by faith, the Bible says, is sin. The book of Romans. That which is not done in faith is sinfulness. That's why it's important for us to understand God's approval on things. The only way to understand His approval is to read His book that His Holy Spirit has approved. And he says, you go back and you show John, you tell him what you've seen and what you've heard. Can you imagine that? Those guys, they may have been the depressed ones. Outside the cold cell, outside, they, they had freedoms, they had privileges. They, they could go wherever they wanted and do whatever they wanted, but maybe they doubted. And John sends them off to go see Jesus. And when they see Jesus, boy, I'm telling you, when you see Jesus at work, your heart will get sparked. You will see life. You'll be rejuvenated. You'll be plugged back in. You'll be ready to go, man. And that's what God was probably wanting to do with these guys. Not just John, but his disciples. And he says, you go show them everything you've heard and seen. Verse 5. You show, see that the blind have received their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf will hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Guys, do you understand? We may not have the deaf around us. We may not have the blind around us. We may not have leprous people around us. We may not have demon-possessed people around us. But we do have poor people around us. Every town, every society. You know what one of the greatest stories is to a poor man? Is you're not poor, buddy. You're not poor. You're rich. Everything that God has is yours, man. You have the power of prayer. If you'll pray and believe, it's yours. It's not a matter of the material things. The rich on this earth are poor. The Bible says the church of Laodicea, they have no idea that they're poor, wretched, naked, miserable, and blind. But the church of Philadelphia, they didn't have much, but they had Jesus, and they had everything. And when you take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the poor, they understand when they receive that same warmth and light that John the Baptist received in that prison he was in, when they understand I am rich, everything that is God's is mine, I'm not looked down on there is a level playing field at the foot of the cross the rich and the poor, the black and the white, there are no differences, there are no exchanges, there are no different people at the foot of the cross, we're all equal, we are sinners, and when sinners come to Jesus and he activates their lives, they are changed and things happen and guys, we can take the gospel to the poor and that's what we need and the poor need to hear it. You are not poor. Don't look down. I remember growing up and I didn't have the same shoes everybody else had. And I didn't have everything they had. And they had motorcycles and they had whatever. I didn't have that stuff. And I always felt inferior. And I always had to come up to a level and find something cool. And we talked about last week. The devil invented cool. The devil invented cool. And everybody in their own right thinks they're cool. I'm a cool this. I'm a cool that. I'm a cool this. I'm a cool, cool, cool. It's about believing. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're uncool, bro. And your hell is going to be very uncool. It's going to be hot. It's going to be miserable. And the devil wants us being cool for 70 years, being in, being kind of famous. And, you know, who outside of Jonesboro knows you? you know, is that what you're after? Who outside this universe knows you? who has plans for you later for the next thousand years to rule big chunks of this planet as one of his. That's cool. 
That's what I want to live for. That's what I want to follow. And guys, the poor need to hear that truth. You are not poor and you will not remain poor. God has some people be rich and some be, being poor. That's His plan. He wants us to pass the test where we are. Pass the test where we are. It's not a matter of eh, eh, this versus that. It's just pass the test where you are. That's what God's looking for. Can He trust me with what I have? And Satan will always use covetousness, wanting more and more and more. And both groups want more. You know, have you ever been around billionaires that just want another billion? John Paul Getty, when he, he was one of the first billionaires, he says, when is enough enough? Having, having things, having money, he says, just a little bit more. That was his answer. Just a little bit more. I'm not quite satisfied yet. Jesus Christ has called us to the place. His gospel is a place of satisfaction. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you content where you are in your position in life? You see, the great gospel to the poor is you are where you're supposed to be. Love what you got. Thank God for what you have. Don't want anything more than Jesus Christ. If there's something more you want than Jesus Christ, you're doing it wrong based on last week. If you love your father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love anything more than me, you're not worthy of me. What is it you want? Our cry needs to be, Jesus, I want you and I want more of it. I want more of you, Jesus. That needs to be our cry to the rich and the poor. It's you, Jesus. It's you, Jesus. It's you, Jesus. And that's the gospel we preach. And that's the gospel that needs to be received. And when people start hearing that gospel preached, they'll understand Jesus loves me. I don't have to achieve. I don't have to impress people. I don't have to keep up with Tommy and the hill figures. I can just do whatever I want to do. And love the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and keep up with Him. And it's a whole lot easier keeping up with Jesus than it is the Joneses. I tell you why. Because his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and he calls us to rest. Come ye apart and rest. <sighs> Keep it up with the Joneses, you gotta work. Oh, I gotta go to this store and buy something for Christmas, and this store over here, and I gotta get something better for Uncle Timmy than Joey's gonna get for him, because oh, I want Timmy, Uncle Timmy to like me better. <laughs> oh, you know, and just work, 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 work. And in the arena of Jesus, it's cool out, it ain't even my birthday. You know what Jesus wants for his birthday? Repentance and obedience. Anything outside of that is, oh, you shouldn't have. No, really, I mean it, you shouldn't have. What are you giving the Lord for this holiday? You. That's all he wants. All I want for Christmas is you. That's Jesus singing to us. Let's give him us. I am the only one who has the power to give me him. You're the only one that has the power to give you to him. Give him the best present ever. Yourself. We go on to verse 6. Everybody's had the gospel preached to him. And blessed is he whosoever will never be stumbling at me. Ashamed of me. Offended in me. Guys, there's, there's been times, I, I confess at first, that you know I've kind of been ashamed. I don't want to be uncool, right? As a Christian, you, you want to be cool. That's one of the problems with American churches today. Youth pastors want their youth groups to be cool. A cool place to, to go. They, 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 want to, they want to beat the, the wearing out of the clothes uh, to the playground. See, when you're cool, you wear your clothes out from the inside. Hey, 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 yeah, hey, look at me, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And youth pastors are wanting the kids to wear their clothes out from the inside like the rest of the world. Being cool. Yeah, and doing more motions inside the clothes than outside the clothes. You guys understand what a brother's trying to get across today? Amen. The way we pray a lot of times, we get to the restaurant, the old, one of my favorites is the old, drop the napkin. Sitting down, ooh, the food comes, ooh, nice, drop the napkin. Oh, excuse me. Hey, Lord, bless this food. Thank you very much for it. Amen. Okay, let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> Or the old, uh, the old sneezer He's using a napkin again. Hey, the food comes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you, God, for this food. Amen. Um, <clears throat> Let's not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Blessed, happy, 
joyful. Even in a prison, you will have a glowing, warm spirit of rejoicing. Even when you're crying, you will have joy. When? When you're not offended in Jesus. When you're not embarrassed by those crazy Christian fanatic folk. Oh, man, that's where the blessing comes in. Satan wants you to think it's right here. Hey, baby, it's cool. Hey, hey, wearing your clothes off on the inside. I am cool. And Jesus is like, no, how about quiet on your knees in the dark and nobody's seeing what you're doing? You know, watch a rap video and turn it down. You'll know what I'm doing. I just performed a rap video for you turned down. It's the funniest story stupidest thing on the planet. Just try it. You want to have fun? Go turn on 30 minutes of rap videos, grab you some popcorn, some root beer, and have a ball. The kingdom of Satan is that stupid. You and I have been called to see greater things. And blessed, happy, joyful, bountiful is he who's not offended in me or my presence. Because I mentioned earlier there have been times in my life that I kind of wanted to be cooler than what other people thought of Jesus. I tried to, you know, be a little different than most Christians because I'm not like most Christians. But really, it's just listening to Jesus and being yourself. If you can learn to be yourself, that's who Jesus wants you to be. Not being ashamed of who you are in Christ. He made me this way. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves me. I'm into it. Let's do this, Lord. I seek you wholeheartedly. I follow after you. And happy is the man, happy is the woman, who's never offended in you in your presence. And Lord, I may have that weakness, and according to your will, and according to your name, and according to your power, I pray that you'll change that in my spirit. And I pray that you'll make me a person who's never offended, ashamed, or stumbles at your presence. Can we pray that prayer? Does God want to answer that prayer? Does God want to change every one of us into that creation, that new creation who's not ashamed at him? Let's look at our verses again. Today we looked at, and it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of talking to his twelve and sending them out, he departed thence for follow-up to teach and preach in the same cities, in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples to go talk to Jesus and said unto him, Hey, are you the guy that, that should come, the Messiah, or are we looking for somebody else, man? Jesus answered and said unto them, Hey, you go back to John and show again those things which you have heard and what you've seen today. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is everyone, John, who is not offended or ashamed or will stumble because of me. And that blessing goes out with all of us today. In the name of Jesus, man, let's go out and be blessed today and follow him and not stumble, but let's step up. Instead of, Jesus says to some folks, I become a tripping stone. They'll trip over me. But to some other people, I become a stepping stone and it lifts them higher. What is Jesus to you? Something you trip over and stumble? Or something that lifts you higher? The believers are lifted higher. Hey guys, we thank you for being a part of the program today. We want to see you saved. We want you to know that you're going to heaven. The Lord has done the same. Are you depressed? Are you down? Are you in a dungeon? Are you darkened? Sometimes you question yourself. You question the Bible. You question Christianity. Get in the Word. Jesus is the light. The Holy Spirit will confirm His love, His value for you in your own heart. Jesus is the way. Beside Him, there is no other. Trust and obey. Trust Him. He loves you. He wants the best for you. and He wants to bring life back into your spirit. If you don't know Him today, call on Him. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He's near never been nearer than he is right now. Call on Jesus. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Join us next time. God bless you.